Okay, here we go again. Welcome back to Physics Computer Science 219A, Quantum Computation. Uh, last time we talked about using quantum computers to address quantum problems, including measuring the energy of a system described by a local Hamiltonian. And I described a way of addressing that problem, which often works, but it doesn't always work. And today I'm going to try to explain why it sometimes fails, namely that finding the ground state of a local Hamiltonian and measuring the energy of that state, sometimes those are really hard problems, which we don't expect to be able to solve efficiently even with a quantum computer. So you remember, we talked last time about using phase estimation to measure the eigenvalues of a local Hamiltonian. And that works if we can prepare a state which has a sufficiently large overlap with the energy eigenstate whose energy we want to measure. And if our criterion is, as we usually assume that we want to be able to solve the problem with a high success probability with a circuit, a quantum circuit of polynomial size, then the criterion for successful state preparation is that we wanna prepare a state which has an inner product with the energy eigenstate that we're interested in, which is no smaller than one over a polynomial uh, in the size of the system. And uh, sometimes that's hard to do. Sometimes we can do it. And uh, we're going to look at that problem from a general perspective today. Um, and it turns out that sometimes we just can't solve the problem. Now, I made some remarks last time about how, as far as we know, with quantum computers, it's possible to simulate efficiently any process that occurs in nature. Now, we don't really know whether that's true or not. It's a conjecture about the laws of physics. And now we're finding that there are certain quantum problems that are just too hard for quantum computers to solve. So that might at first seem discouraging from the point of view of our uh, aspiration to use quantum computers to study the world of quantum physics, but it's not necessarily so. The right attitude to take, perhaps, is that if there's some task which is just too hard for us to perform with a quantum computer described by our quantum circuit model, then it's not just hard for us and for the quantum engineers of the future, it is also hard for nature. So if it's the case that preparing a state which has a substantial overlap with, for example, the ground state of some local Hamiltonian, if that's hard for us, it's hard for nature as well. And therefore we won't expect to see systems described by such Hamiltonians uh, in, um, they're ground states. And so that isn't necessarily a obstacle to uh, achieving our goal of using quantum computers to study whatever physics occurs in the natural world. Aside from the point that uh, the particular Hamiltonian that describes the world isn't necessarily one in which the uh, ground state is hard to prepare. In fact, uh, it's probably not. Um, we have uh, physical laws that we think describe the microscopic world, like the standard model of particle physics. And uh, we don't think that the ground state of quantum chromodynamics, for example, is a hard state to prepare, either with a quantum computer or a hard task for nature. Um, somehow uh, the universe figures out how to do it, at least to a good approximation. In other words, in the uh, in intergalactic space uh, to a certain approximation, uh, what we find is something like the vacuum of quantum chromodynamics. 
Okay, so I guess um, I haven't started my presentation mode here, but let's do that now. Okay, so, but first I want to talk about the corresponding classical problem, because even there, uh, it turns out, they're very simple looking, what I'll call classical Hamiltonians, for which finding the ground state is an NP hard problem. And therefore we don't expect to be able to solve it efficiently with either classical or um, quantum computers. And such Hamiltonians really do seem to occur in nature. Um, and um, they occur in particular in systems that have what we call disorder, uh, systems that are sufficiently dirty that the Hamiltonian can not be, uh, you know, isn't spatially uniform. So it varies from point to point because of the dirt more or less randomly distributed in the sample. And for systems like that, uh, in practice, they have trouble finding their ground states. And correspondingly, it's hard for us to find the ground state on a classical or quantum computer. So something that we haven't discussed yet, but which we better discuss now, is the satisfiability problem, which is an example of an NP complete problem. I mentioned some examples of NP complete problems when we talked about NP completeness, but I only gave one example where I gave you the argument for NP completeness. That was the problem uh, circuit set, which is NP complete sort of by definition. Um, but uh, a problem which is closer to the sort of problem that a physicist might encounter is the satisfiability problem where we have some set of clauses and we want to know whether there's some assignment of values to all the variables that satisfies all the clauses. Um, that's called a SAT problem. And when I say that we're talking about a classical problem, uh, well, if you like, what I mean is that all the terms in the Hamiltonian commute with one another. Uh, you can just think of that as um, a problem in which the variables are bits. Or if you want to be, make it sound more quantum, we could say that we can write the Hamiltonian in terms of operators that preserve the computational basis, like the poly operator Z, which is diagonal in the uh, standard basis of the state zero and the state one. So uh, let me remind you about uh, circuit set. Well, let me remind you about NP for a second. So the thing about NP is that if we have an appropriate witness, if someone is kind enough to provide a witness uh, for an instance of a problem, uh, we can uh, verify efficiently once we have the witness uh, whether a uh, you know, particular string is in the language or not. There's some polynomial size verifier circuit, a uh, classical circuit, when, when we provide it with uh, the instance and the witness in polynomial time, it can tell us uh, whether that uh, instance is accepted into the language or not. So uh, what I explained in a previous lecture was that any problem in NP reduces to the problem circuit sat. Circuit sat is just the problem given a circuit, uh, is there some particular input to the circuit? We're given a classical description of a classical circuit. And the question is, uh, is there any input to the circuit which is accepted for which it outputs the answer bit one or the answer yes. And if we have a uh, magic machine that solves circuits at, we can use it to find the solution to uh, any problem in NP. That's what we mean by NP complete. Uh, so specifically, I can consider for a particular instance, the uh, circuit with that fixed instance, but with some variable witness. And I can ask, is there any uh, witness for which this verifier circuit accepts. And circuit sat answers that question. It tells me whether or not there is such a witness Y so that um, the pair X comma Y is accepted by 
the verifier circuit and that answers uh, whether the answer to the uh, NP problem is yes or no. Now, what I want to explain uh, in a minute is a further reduction of circuit SAT to a satisfiability problem, uh, three SAT, I'll explain what that is, uh, from which we conclude that three SAT is also an NP complete problem, presumably then too hard a problem to solve efficiently in general for classical or quantum computers. Um, and we can think of three SAT as a kind of model of a physical system. I'll explain a little bit more about that too. Um, there is um, another problem, which is uh, NP hard, which involves uh, just um, clauses that act on two variables. In the case of three set, the clauses act on sets of three variables. And uh, in the case of two set, which is finding whether a set of clauses acting on two variables have a satisfying assignment. That's in P. There are algorithms for solving that. But uh, a problem which is NP hard is max two set. That is, if I have some uh, set of clauses, each acting on two variables, I would like to ask, what is the assignment that satisfies the maximal number of them? Uh, that is an NP hard problem. And that's even closer to physics. Uh, it, can be regarded as a model of um, a system in which uh, the variables just interact pairwise and we're trying to find the lowest energy state of such a system. That can be a hard problem. And furthermore, I'm not going to give detailed arguments for this, but it's, um, it's a true fact that that NP hardness is preserved um, even if the Hamiltonian is geometrically local. And that's even more like physics, since typically the interactions that we encounter in a physical system are geometrically local. And that's true even in two spatial dimensions. So the real, what physicists call spin glasses are disordered materials uh, in two or three dimensions that um, are reasonably well modeled by these uh, two sad formulas. And uh, so we think in the case of the real spin glasses that we can study in the lab, those systems just won't relax to the ground state in an amount of time polynomial in the system size. So, you know, if we have Avogadro's number uh, of uh, spins in a sample, they'll just, they'll just never find uh, the ground state or at some uh, non-zero temperature relax to a thermal distribution. So that's kind of interesting really because it means that uh, we're getting some insight into physics from computational complexity. We have some uh, naturally occurring system that we can make in the lab and um, maybe we find experimentally that it just doesn't want to relax to equilibrium at low temperature. It doesn't want to relax to its ground state in particular at very low temperature and we wonder why. And then we say, aha, it turns out that if that system could find its ground state, it would be solving efficiently an NP hard problem. And we don't think nature is capable of that. Of course, that too is a hypothesis. We don't think nature can uh, solve efficiently uh, NP hard problems. And that's why these spin glasses that we study in the lab or that's uh, a satisfying explanation for why they don't uh, relax to their ground states. Okay, so enough philosophy. Uh, what do I mean by the KSAT problem? I just mean that I have a bunch of clauses. Each uh, clause acts on at most K binary variables. And I'm asking whether all of those clauses can be simultaneously satisfied, okay? Is there any assignment to all of the n variables so that all of the clauses, each acting on at most k variables, are satisfied? So that's what I meant here. Given this formula, we say the answer to the question is yes, uh, if there's some assignment for which all the clauses are satisfied. And so what I want to convince you of is that um, 
we can reduce circuit sad to three sad. So we already know circuit sad is an NP complete problem. So the same is true of three sad. If we could solve three sad uh, efficiently, then we'd be able to efficiently solve any problem in NP. So specifically, what I want to say is given some circuit, I'd like to find the corresponding Boolean formula such that there is some input to the circuit which is accepted by the circuit if and only if there exists some satisfying assignment for that Boolean formula. We want to find a Boolean formula given the circuit that has that property. So here's what we're going to do. For each one of the gates in the circuit, we're going to write down a corresponding clause. And we're going to assign variables to the inputs and outputs of all the gates. So let's say there's some gate in the circuit, which has input bits, X and Y, maps them to an output bit. You know, this is a uh, some gate in a universal set, like it's uh, an AND or an OR or an AND or something. And what we want our clause to do is to check whether that gate is executed correctly. So uh, we have variables X and Y for the incoming bits to the gate and Z to the output gate. And we want that clause to evaluate to true uh, if and only if the output is the correct output given these input bits. Um, according to uh, the function defined by this gate. So only if z is equal to um, g of x, y, if and only if. Now we might also have some uh, input bits into the circuit. And so for each one of the input bits, uh, we'll consider a corresponding clause, which is just going to enforce that the input bits have the right value. So there's some particular um, string, which is an input to the circuit, which identifies the particular instance of the problem that uh, we're interested in solving. And we want each one of those bits in the string to be what it's supposed to be. So we put in a clause where here uh, the clause depends only on this variable, which is output from this gate. It doesn't have any input and uh, it evaluates to true only if y really is what it's supposed to be, main, namely y is equal to x. And then at the end, we're going to measure the answer bit <clears throat> to find out whether the circuit accepts or not. And we'll put in a clause for that as well. Uh, there's some uh, bit that we read out at the end and the circuit accepts uh, if and only if uh, that bit is one. So we'll put in a clause for that. Uh, this clause evaluates to true if and only if that answer bit is really equal one. Okay. So as I said, we can think of a formula in which all of the variables are the bits which are input and output from each one of the gates in the circuit. We put in a clause um, for each one of the gates. And if every one of the clauses evaluates to true, that means the circuit is validly executed. All the, uh, the inputs check, all the gates check, and the answer checks. The number of clauses that we'll need is just going to be a polynomial in N because we're considering a circuit of polynomial size, okay? Um, and uh, so that's really it, okay? The witness for the three set formula is an assignment of all the variables that satisfies all the clauses. Or in other words, the witness is a history of the computation. It tells us at all stages of the computation uh, what the values of the variables will be. And, um, and we can easily check. Um, that uh, satisfying assignment for the three set formula, a check that we really have a valid history of the computation. Now we can define a sad problem 
a k set problem for, for any value of k, where we allow the clauses to act on k variables instead of just three. But for the reduction to circuit set, three set is enough because we have universal gates, which take two input variables to one output variable. So to check all the gates, uh, we only need clauses that act on three variables at once. So the uh, witness is the global history of the computation that um, accepts an input. And um, the thing is we can check that history locally, right? We can, one at a time, we can look at all the locations in the circuit, all the gates, verify they were executed correctly. And uh, then we know indeed um, that we have a satisfying assignment. Uh, remember the, one of the clauses checks that the answer bit really is one. And now I invite you to think of our three set formula as the Hamiltonian of some physical system. It's I, what I'm calling a classical Hamiltonian. It depends on um, uh, bit variables. So there's some number of bits and bits. The Hamiltonian is a sum of terms, one corresponding to each clause. So the Hamiltonian depends on a bit string of length n, but it can be written as a sum of terms. Uh, each one of these terms is, um, I guess, um, I should have, no, this is fine, okay. And so each one of these terms involves only three variables. And we choose uh, each one of the terms in the Hamiltonian uh, to take the value zero if the uh, clause involving those three val variables evaluates to true and one if it's um, false. And so the energy will be zero for the lowest energy state. Of course, this Hamiltonian is non-negative. There aren't any bit strings for which its value is less than zero. And it is zero only if every term in the Hamiltonian is zero. It's always either zero or one. Every term in the Hamiltonian being zero means that all of the clauses evaluate to true. And that's the satisfying assignment for our three set formula. So the lowest possible energy, the minimum for any input string of the value of the uh, Hamiltonian is zero only if there is some satisfying assignment. The minimum is achieved by that satisfying assignment. If there is no satisfying assignment, then there isn't any choice of the variables for which all of the terms in the Hamiltonian are zero. At least one of them has to be one so in that case, the minimal energy will be at least one. So that means that the problem of evaluating the energy for a Hamiltonian of this form to constant accuracy, well enough to distinguish the energy zero from the energy one, uh, that allows us to solve three sets. So that means that the problem of finding the minimum energy of such a Hamiltonian is itself NP hard. If we could do that, we could solve three set, we could solve circuit set, we could solve any problem in NP. Now, uh, further things are true and I'm not going to give the um, arguments for this. I already briefly mentioned this earlier, but what physicists really do sometimes use to um, model disordered spin systems is uh, an Ising spin glass Hamiltonian. Ising is just uh, somebody's name, although some people pronounce it Ising. I grew up saying Ising. Um, it's a Hamiltonian of this form. Now the um, Hamiltonian is a sum of terms which just act on two variables. Now I've reverted to our, our poly operator uh, notation here. Um, I'm considering each binary variable to take values either plus one or minus one. So you can think of that as like the poly operator Z. That's why I wrote it as Z. And we um, 
you can imagine that we have a system on a lattice in some number of dimensions. Um, two dimensions is actually enough. <clears throat> two or three is what we're usually interested in for experiments in the lab. Uh, potentially, we'd be interested in things which uh, are not geometrically local in three dimensions if we have a way of engineering a system with long range interactions among the spins. But let's suppose there are only local interactions on some lattice, let's say a two dimensional lattice. And the Hamiltonian that I want to consider uh, looks like this. There are pairs of spins which are neighbors on the lattice. This means I'm summing over neighbors. And associated with each pair, there's a term in the Hamiltonian Jij, Zi, Zj. Uh, Jij can be zero, in which case there isn't really a term uh, for that particular pair. It can be plus one or it can be minus one. Because I put this minus sign in front, when it's plus one, uh, this term is happy. Um, it has the lowest um, possible value when the product zi, zj is plus one. So that means the two spins agree. They're either both plus one or they're both minus one. And we say the spins line up in that case. We say an edge um, or a pair of neighbors for which a jij is positive is ferromagnetic. It makes the spins want to line up. In ferromagnet, spins like to line up. And if jij is negative, then in order for uh, the energy to be minimized, uh, we'll want JIG, uh, ZI, ZJ to be minus one. So in that case, the spins have opposite values. If one is plus one, the other one is minus one. And we call that an anti-ferromagnetic coupling for that pair of spins. Um, anti-ferromagnets, neighboring spins, one to anti-align. And if we have only ferromagnetic couplings, then it's pretty easy for the system to figure out how to minimize its energy, and it's easy for us too. Uh, we would want all the spins to just line up with one another, to either all be plus one or all be minus one, and then all these terms would be happy. Um, but when we have anti-ferromagnetic couplings, things are more complicated. That can result in um, frustration. So for example, I might have uh, three spins where each pair of the three couples to one another and spins one and two then want to disagree and two and three want to disagree, but that would make two and three agree. So we can't simultaneously make all of those pairs of spins happy. That's what I mean by frustration. We can compound the frustration further by adding what a physicist would call a magnetic field. That's just a term uh, zi, which uh, could take the value either plus one or minus one. Uh, it could also be zero, in which case we would say there isn't any um, magnetic field at that, at that particular site in our lattice. And that can also cause further frustration because a spin might want to anti-align with its neighbors or line up with its neighbors according to the nearest neighbor couplings, but then this local magnetic field wants it to point the opposite way and it doesn't know what to do. So it turns out that in even two dimensions, if we have both these ferromagnetic and anti-ferromagnetic couplings and these local fields, uh, for the, the choice of Jij and the Hi's, that's some instance of the problem. And there will be cases where it's very hard to find the ground state energy. There are many low lying states and we could try to use a kind of local relaxation model, which is something like what the system in the lab would do to try to find lower energy states. The trouble is that there's a very complicated energy landscape. So you might get stuck in a local minimum and there isn't any way just by flipping one spin at a time to get out of that local minimum, you have to strategically flip many spins at once, at once to find a lower energy state. And that's, that's hard for the system to do. And it's hard for us to know how to do it because there are so many different choices for how we can flip many spins at once in order to find one that actually lowers the energy. So it's a hard problem. Um, the quantum version of the problem is 
we consider terms in the Hamiltonian which don't necessarily commute with one another. That can make it even harder to find low energy states. There's further frustration just resulting from the uh, failure to commute of the different terms in the Hamiltonian so they can't be simultaneously diagonalized. In the classical case, we can simultaneously diagonalize them, but there's still frustration because uh, different terms are happy in different ways. In the quantum case, in a sense, things are even worse because we can't even simultaneously diagonalize. And the corresponding formal uh, statement is that if we have a local classical Hamiltonian, we're here just by local, I mean um, that the terms in the Hamiltonian just act on some bounded number of variables, three in this case, finding the lowest energy state of such a Hamiltonian is NP hard, so pretty hard. Uh, in the quantum case, the corresponding problem is QMA hard in general. Um, it's as hard as any problem in QMA, the quantum analog of NP, and we expect that that's even harder. So finding low energy states of quantum Hamiltonians is even harder than um, solving NP complete problems. So let's uh, try to understand in more depth uh, why that's true. Why is this a QMA complete problem? Well, first of all, what is the problem? So I'm gonna consider a K-local quantum Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is a sum of terms. K-local means that each one of these terms act non-trivially on no more than K qubits. And I'm going to choose each one of the terms to have a bounded operator norm. And now the problem is this, we're given a promise that the lowest energy eigenstate of this Hamiltonian, each one of the terms is Hermitian, of course. So the uh, total Hamiltonian is Hermitian. Uh, the total Hamiltonian is some really big matrix. It can be diagonalized. It has real eigenvalues. Uh, there's some lowest energy state, which has the smallest eigenvalue. It might be degenerate. There might be more than one state with that lowest value of the energy. And I'm not necessarily insisting that um, that be a unique, but um, there's some ground state energy. And I'm promised, I'm given two numbers, two real numbers. I'm calling E low and E high. They're separated by some amount, which is uh, no smaller than one over a polynomial in the size of the system. And the promise is that the ground state energy is either less than or equal to the lower value E low, or it's greater than the higher value E high, or promised it's not somewhere in between. And the problem is to answer, which is it? Is it less than or equal to E low or is it greater than E high? All right. And so if we can efficiently with the quantum computer um, find the ground state energy to some accuracy one over polynomial of n, that would suffice to solve the problem. And remember, as we discussed last time, if we can prepare a state which has a overlap with the ground state, no less than one over polynomial of n, then by using phase estimation, we can, with a circuit of poly n size, uh, find the ground state energy. So if local Hamiltonian is a hard problem, that means that preparing a state with a sufficiently large overlap, not smaller than one over polynomial of n, uh, with the ground state has got to be a hard problem. So what I want to show you is that in the case k equals five, uh, five local Hamiltonian is QMA complete. Actually, it's possible to do better than k equals five, but the argument for k equals five is, um, is easier. And uh, this was one of Kataev's great contributions, by the way, uh, to discover that the k local Hamiltonian is, um, is a QMA complete problem. Uh, 
which he discovered sometime in the in the 1990s. Uh, and he his original argument established QMA completeness for five local Hamiltonians that was later improved. And now we know that uh, we can have geometrically local two local Hamiltonians and it's still QMA hard, but I'm not gonna show that to you today. We'll stick with the five local case following more or less Kataev's original argument, which is also in his book, um, the, the book KSV that uh, is mentioned on the course uh, webpage. He didn't publish it as a paper, it's only in the book. So we have to, to show two things to show that it's QMA complete. First of all, that the problem is in QMA. And secondly, uh, that any problem in QMA reduces to five local Hamiltonian. Um, well, the first part is, uh, maybe I forgot to say this. Uh, the first part we've already done. Uh, to show that K local Hamiltonian is QMA, that means that there must be some witness um, for which we can verify the answer. The witness is just the ground state. If Merlin is so kind as to provide us with um, the quantum state as a witness, which is um, has the minimal energy of the local Hamiltonian, we can measure the uh, using phase estimation with the polynomial size circuit, we can measure the energy to accuracy one over any power of n that we want. And uh, that once uh, we've got our estimate of the ground state energy, we can uh, check that um, if it's, we can check whether it's less than ELO. If we can verify that there's some state which has energy less than uh, ELO, then we know the ground state energy has to be less than ELO, and so we can verify the yes answer. That doesn't tell us how to verify the uh, no answer, but that's okay. For QMA, we just need to be able to verify the yes answer. So uh, what we'll have to do a little work to show is that any problem in QMA reduces to five local Hamiltonian. But the strategy we use is gonna be very similar to what we use in the classical case. Um, remember, the um, analogously with, uh, with NP, a problem in QMA has a quantum verifier circuit, which for a given instance, uh, accepts some quantum witness uh, if and only if uh, that uh, instance is in the language, okay? So what we wanna do is to construct a local Hamiltonian like we did in the classical case that checks each gate in the quantum circuit, checks each gate of the verifier circuit for the QMA problem. And the, um, the witness is going to somehow encode the whole history of the computation, just like that three set formula in the classical case. Uh, encoded the whole history of the computation. And that history is something we can check locally to see that gate by gate, the quantum circuit was evaluated appropriately, that the evaluation was valid, that the right quantum gates were applied. And we'll construct our Hamiltonian so that it has um, low energy if the verifier circuit accepts the witness with probability uh, sufficiently high, greater than two thirds, although with amplification, we can imagine it's close to one. Um, and uh, that there is no low energy state of that Hamiltonian if the, um, if the witness rejects, if the witness is rejected rather by the verifier, no matter how we choose the witness. Okay. Um, oh, here's where I said it. Yeah, we've already shown part one, I just said that. So for part two, uh, we want Merlin to help us out. Merlin is supposed to provide a quantum state that encodes the history of the verifier computation, which uh, we can check locally. So how are we going to encode the history? I'm gonna do it this way. I'm gonna consider a history state. I called it eta for some reason I can't remember. <clears throat> and it has two uh, registers, this state. Uh, one uh, keeps track of the state of the quantum computer 
step by step during a computation. The other register keeps track of the time, so to speak. It keeps track of where we are in the computation. So what the history state does, if they're all together, capital T, gates in the quantum computation, is it's a superposition over times going from uh, zero to uh, capital T of T in the time register tensored with the state of the quantum computer uh, at that time when we execute the circuit. So in other words, what I mean by psi of T is there some input, which is the witness uh, to the QMA complete problem. And uh, then the gates applied by the circuit are U1, U2, U3, and so on in sequence. So when I've gotten up to time T, the unitary that's been applied to the input witness is this product. Um, first U1, then U2, blah, 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 up to UT. So we can think of this register as the clock. It keeps track of where we are in the evaluation of the circuit, keeps track of what step we're at, what time it is, so to speak. And so now our local Hamiltonian is going to be constructed so that history states, which uh, have a valid input and get a yes answer in the output for which all of the gates are the correct gates specified by this quantum circuit, we want those to have low energy and we want states where the uh, witness gets rejected or where the uh, quantum circuit was not validly executed to have high energy. And we want to do that with a local Hamiltonian and it's going to be a sum of uh, four terms. I'm calling them H in, H out, H prop, and H clock. So what H in does is it checks that any input bits that we're going to use for scratch, which let's say are supposed to be initialized to um, computational basis state zero, that all of those are correctly initialized. So it will penalize a state in which those initial uh, input bits are one instead of zero. H out is the term that's going to check the answer. And we want the, uh, when we measure the output bit at the end to uh, be in the state one. So what H out is supposed to do is to penalize uh, states in which that final answer bit is zero. And H clock will come to later. Um, it, we have to encode the time in an appropriate way so that our Hamiltonian uh, will be local. And uh, what H clock will do is it will impose a penalty if the encoding of the clock is not properly done. And then there's going to be a term which I call H prop, meaning it propagates the, st the state along uh, step by step. And the job of H prop is to enforce that at each time we're applying the right gate. In other words, it should impose a penalty if the gate that uh, we apply at um, a particular step of the computation is not the right gate. So in order to get a low energy state of the Hamiltonian, uh, everything has to be done properly. We execute the right quantum circuit with the input bits fixed correctly. We wind up with one in the answer bit, at least with high probability uh, when we measure it. And uh, thanks to H prop, all the gates in the computation are the correct ones um, for the uh, circuit of interest which we imagine is the verifier circuit for some um, QMA problem, some particular instance of it, acting on the witness that um, Merlin provides. So let's talk about H prop. Um, so here's, I've just rewritten the history state again to remind you what it looks like. We're uh, coherently superposing over all of the times um, at each time that's correlated with the state of the quantum computer at that particular time. Different times in the time register are orthogonal states. Um, so each one of these states has norm one and they're orthonormal because the times are different. To normalize it then I just uh, divide 
by the total number of different times represented here, uh, including time zero. So that's altogether capital T plus one times. And so the state as I've written it here is normalized to one. Psi of t again is uh, the particular sequence of gates that have been applied up to time little t acting on our uh, input witness. So I want h prop to do the job that if we apply u sub t at time t like we're supposed to, h prop will have zero energy, okay? Um, and here's how I'm going to choose it. It's going to be a sum of terms, um, a term for each time. And the term for time t is going to look like this. It has um, a term that projects the time onto t, another term that projects the time onto time t minus 1. And then there are these terms which change the time. Uh, this uh, maps the time on the clock t minus 1 to time t. And as it does so, it applies the unitary ut. And I put this in with a minus sign. And then I also have its Hermitian conjugate. Of course, uh, the Hamiltonian's got to be Hermitian. Uh, these terms are uh, real and diagonal. They're Hermitian. Uh, this one isn't. Uh, so I have its Hermitian conjugate as well. And what that does is it evolves the state backward in time. It takes the state of the clock t to the next earliest time, t minus 1. And as it does so, it applies the inverse of u sub t. Okay, um, or it's adjoint. And so now we can ask, um, once we've reached state, state t minus one or state t of the um, computation, uh, what does h prop do to one of these states in the superposition, like psi of t minus one tensored with clock time t minus one? Um, well, uh, this particular term is going to act only uh, with this guy and this guy because the time t here and here is orthogonal to t minus one. The, um, this term just projects out that the time and doesn't act on the state. So uh, it leaves the state alone. Um, psi of t minus one tensor t minus one. Um, but this guy, it advances the clock from time t minus one to time t. And as it does so, it applies u sub t. So what that does is it advances the state from a psi of t minus one to a psi of t like it's supposed to. But I can also consider the action of this h prop on um, the uh, psi of t tensor t uh, part of the superposition. So now the terms that are going to uh, not annihilate the state are this one, which uh, is just the identity acting on this state. And that gives rise to this term. And this one, which makes the time go backwards um, from t to t minus 1 and applies a uh, ut adjoint. Um, and um, so look at what we've got here. This ut adjoint is going to make psi of t go to psi of t minus 1. It uh, takes a step back in the circuit. Luckily, our unitary gates are all reversible. So we can take steps backward, just like we can take steps forward. And I put in these minus signs now. You can see why. Uh, this state is psi of t minus 1 tensor t minus 1. This state is also psi of t minus 1 tensor t minus 1. Um, because, like I said, ut adjoint takes psi of t to psi of t minus 1. So these two cancel one another. And here we have this psi of t tensor uh, t. And this state is also psi of t tensor t because ut takes psi of t minus 1 to psi of t. So these two also cancel one another. Okay. So you can go through uh, how the terms in the Hamiltonian act on all the terms in the superposition. And you can see that h prop uh, defined this way, in fact, annihilates 
uh, every term of the superposition. We always get these cancellations. And so that means when we have the valid history state, uh, H prop is going to be equal to zero. And in fact, um, that's its lowest energy state. Uh, we can actually find the whole spectrum of H prop. And so uh, in particular, I'd like to know what is the gap between the energy of the lowest energy eigenstate of H prop and its first excited state. But uh, we'll do better than that. We can completely um, diagonalize H prop. Turns out not to be that hard. And in fact, uh, to make that convenient, to make it easy, we can make a change of basis by diagonalizing H prop by a particular unitary to make it especially clear how to diagonalize it. Now, if we conjugate uh, H by um, a unitary, that doesn't change its spectrum. That doesn't change the eigenvalues of H prop. It only changes the eigenstates corresponding to each one of the eigenvalues. Um, well, what I do is I consider V, which um, at time T, applies the appropriate unitary evaluated by the circuit up to time t, um, namely the product u sub t, u sub t minus one, blah, 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 u one. Uh, I sum that over all possible values of the clock. And what that does is it removes the u sub t's. Well, essentially, essentially, we've gone to what uh, sometimes we, we call the moving frame. Now we're looking at the state from a point of view that rotates as the clock advances. And so um, because of the rotation, the state doesn't seem to change with time at all. Because uh, every time we advance the time, we're choosing a reference frame which has that extra use of t uh, multiplying it. So the multiplication by u uh, sub t becomes just the identity in that rotating frame. And we can get, that means we can get rid of the u's in, the, um, in u prop. And so um, now it's simpler. We have the terms which are diagonal in the time. Uh, but, and we have these propagation terms which change the time advanced time t minus one to t and its Hermitian conjugate, which goes backwards, takes time t back to time t minus one. And now we have to diagonalize this matrix. Um, and um, that's something uh, that we can do. Capital T um, is uh, going to be polynomial in N. And so, um, Actually, this is a problem which I explained in detail in the notes, but I'm not going to go through it in class, how you do the diagonalization. But essentially, um, the idea is to Fourier transform to um, this is a, sort of a translation invariant in time, a Hamiltonian, except um, that it has endpoints at time zero and uh, time capital T. But in, in the middle of the chain of times, um, it looks the same at each time. So the way to diagonalize it is to uh, consider a, um, a state which has a definite frequency in which the time t occurs with um, a coefficient which goes like e to the i omega t for some omega. And, um, if it weren't for the boundary terms, if it weren't for the fact that we have boundary conditions at little t equals zero and little t equals capital T, um, that, would, uh, that would diagonalize H prop. Uh, but then because of the boundary conditions, there are only special values of omega, uh, which are allowed. And in the notes, I worked out uh, what those special values are. Um, it turns out that, um, you ignore the boundary conditions. The uh, positive frequency and negative frequency have the same eigenvalues for H prop. And so we can put together 
e to the i omega t and e to the minus i omega t uh, to uh, get an eigenstate. Or in other words, we can choose the coefficients to be a cosine of um, omega t plus a constant. And um, to handle the boundary conditions right, you have to choose omega k to have special values, which are just integer multiples of pi over capital T plus one. And you can find the corresponding eigenvalues um, of these energy eigenstates, which are just two sine squared omega k. So like I said, there are details in the notes. But this problem is actually mathematically identical to a problem you might have encountered in a physics class, namely the problem of finding the normal modes of a chain of oscillators, a chain of masses connected by springs, uh, for example, where all the masses are the same and all the strings have the same, um, the same uh, spring constant, uh, but with boundary conditions, um, holding the masses at the ends fixed. And it's the same problem mathematically, and it's not too hard to solve, though I went through a page or so of algebra to do it in the notes, which I'm not going to reproduce here. But at any rate, what we're especially interested in is the difference between the energy of the ground state, which is zero. Um, that's just the omega equals zero case here, where uh, this energy is zero. And then the first excited state is when omega has the uh, lowest possible value of pi over uh, t plus one. And um, so the difference between the energy of the first excited state and the ground state is two sine squared pi over two t plus one. And uh, if t is a big number, let's say polynomial in n, where uh, you know n is a large uh, input size, then um, that's approximately pi squared over two t plus one squared. In other words, I just do the approximation to the sine, sine x approximately x, square that, multiply by two, and I've got this. So if since the, um, the circuit that we're considering has polynomial size, um, that's uh, a splitting which goes like one over a polynomial of n. Okay. So um, there's one more thing. We have to make sure that we get the right answer. I haven't said explicitly what the H out term is in the Hamiltonian. Uh, it'll be something like this. We wanted to penalize the answer bit if at the final time, capital T, the uh, output bit has the value zero instead of one. We're interested in the case where the witness is accepted, where when we measure the output bit, we get the value one. So what H out does is it just looks at the final time on the clock, capital T, and it penalizes the output bit being zero instead of one, okay? So let's say that um, we consider a verifier circuit that accepts with a probability close to one, uh, one minus epsilon. Then if we consider a valid circuit, uh, that H prop will be happy. If the input bits are set uh, properly, HN will be happy. I'll assume the clock is properly encoded, which means H clock is also happy. So the only um, term that might not be completely happy is the uh, H out term. Um, and so the only contribution for that state corresponding to the valid history state to the expectation value of the Hamiltonian comes from H out. Uh, that contribution occurs only when the clock is capital T because H out projects onto capital T. So in this superposition, it's only the uh, term with the time equal capital T uh, that matters. And then if um, we get the value <coughs> zero, uh, with probability epsilon instead of the value one, uh, then the expectation value of H out will be epsilon over uh, T plus one. 
So there is a state, namely the valid history state, um, which has an expectation value of the full Hamiltonian epsilon over t plus one. So there must be, so we uh, the ground state energy can't be higher than that. It has to be less than or equal to epsilon over t plus one. That t plus one is a little bit annoying. Actually, there's a way to get rid of it uh, so that this actually becomes um, epsilon times some constant. Instead, uh, the trick for doing that is that we can add extra steps to the computation in which nothing happens. So uh, the clock continues advancing up to some time like say capital uh, T times two. And, um, but uh, during those additional time steps, there are no additional uh, unitaries um, applied. And um, so the, the uh, output bit isn't changing at all. And then we could have our H out project not just onto time uh, capital T, but have terms projecting onto later times as well, capital T plus one, capital T plus two, and so on. And um, so if you measure at any one of those times, uh, you'll, get, you'll get the same answer. Um, so um, you'll get um, a um, expectation value for each one of those terms, epsilon over t plus one, but they're ordered capital T of them. So that makes the, um, then the conclusion is the expectation value is actually epsilon. Um, and um, well, it doesn't really matter, but the t plus one is, doesn't necessarily have to be there, I guess is the point. Now there's another thing, which is I can imagine we make epsilon small by amplifying. You remember in the, in the definition of QMA, um, we um, assume that, uh, you know, if something's in the language, we, uh, we accept with probability at least two thirds, uh, just like in the, the case of um, BPP. Um, but uh, I can have multiple copies of the witness and uh, check them all and I can make the, um, make that probability very close to one. Now, that's a little bit tricky because we don't necessarily trust Merlin and he won't necessarily give us a, uh, when we ask for multiple copies of the witness, a tensor product of the different copies, he might uh, try to give us uh, some entangled state, entangled across the copies, uh, but we can still amplify because if we look at each one of those copies uh, one by one, tracing out the other copies, you know, if each copy gets accepted with uh, probability two thirds, then, um, then we'll still be able to amplify. I won't explain that in detail, but at any rate, you can amplify and you can make epsilon uh, exponentially small with a, um, with a polynomial number of, um, of runs or a polynomial number of copies of the witness as usual. Okay, so now, um, so let's imagine epsilon is really small, as small as we need it to be. Now, uh, what's our Hamiltonian? I'm still gonna ignore H clock. I'm gonna suppose we, uh, we make H clock happy by validly including the clock. I haven't told you what H clock is yet. I'm gonna come to that next. Uh, but before we get to that, um, we're just considering HN plus H out plus H prop. I'm gonna call that H1 plus H2. I'm gonna separate the HN plus H out term, which checks our input scratch bits and uh, checks the answer, call that H1. And then H2 is the, uh, the propagating part, which advances the time. These are two uh, non-negative operators. They both have states with zero eigenvalue, what I'm calling null vectors, uh, states that they annihilate. So in the case of H2, that is H prop, as we've seen, uh, it annihilates a state in which all the steps in the computation are valid. In the case of H1, that is Hn in plus H out, um, it annihilates a state in which the um, answer bit is one and the uh, input scratch bits are properly prepared 
all in the state zero, say. Um, but the null vectors for H1 and H2 are uh, not the same necessarily. In fact, if epsilon is non-zero, uh, they're not the same because when we have a valid history, uh, we don't always get H1. So the valid history state is one in which the expectation value of H1 is positive. And likewise, the state in which H1 um, is, um, has expectation value zero, the output bit is exactly one, and then we won't have a valid history state. So we have these two, we have a Hamiltonian, which is sum of two terms. Uh, each one of them um, has a null vector. Each one of them has a gap between its uh, null vector and the, which has eigenvalue zero and the next highest eigenvalue. In the case of H1, the gap is just one because, um, you know, the, the next eigenstate is one in which one of the uh, input bits or, or the answer bit has uh, the wrong value and that's going to cost one in energy. In the case of H2, we've already said what the gap is because um, we diagonalized H prop. And so that gap is this guy, essentially uh, a constant over T plus one squared. Um, and um, so I'm, there's an argument in the notes which gets a little involved and I'm not gonna go through it, but you can believe that from the information that we have, H1 and H2 have null vectors. And um, when we consider the state, which is a, a null vector of H2, uh, H1 has this expectation value epsilon over T plus one uh, rather than zero. Uh, we know the gap for H1 and we know the gap for H2 and that's enough for us to get a lower bound on the expectation value of H1 plus H2 in any state. And here I've just written down the answer. I'm not going to go through the argument though. There are details in the notes. And uh, the important thing is that, well, we wind up uh, getting an answer that depends on, uh, on this epsilon and also on this gap so this is the dependence on that gap coming in. This is the dependence on epsilon. And we wind up with something like one minus the square root of epsilon over T plus one cubed. Two powers of T plus one coming from this gap, one power of T plus one coming from this, um, this bound on, um, on the energy for uh, valid history states, which as I said, we could get rid of by modifying the circuit a little bit. The important thing is that um, we have this expression for the energy um, and um, we have this expression. Actually, there are two different epsilons here. Um, I should apologize for that, I guess. So here I'm talking about the case where the acceptance probability is one minus epsilon. And, um, and then we know that there have to be states with an energy for uh, this Hamiltonian, which are less than epsilon over T plus one. So in the case where we accept with high probability, energy very close to zero. Here I'm considering the case where the epsilon, the acceptance probability is epsilon, not one minus epsilon. So I'm interested in the rejection case where we accept with small probability now. So that means this epsilon is small. And so this is essentially one over some polynomial in N, that polynomial being determined by the size of the circuit. So once we've made epsilon smaller than uh, some power by amplification, we have a separation between the case where the verifier accepts and the case where the verifier rejects. Um, and so we can make the energy in the case of uh, acceptance smaller than the energy in the case of rejection 
by some one over polynomial n factor, okay? So that's the reduction that we wanted. It means that, you know, if we can solve the local Hamiltonian problem, if we can say for this Hamiltonian, h in plus h out plus h prop plus h clock, uh, whether its lowest energy state has energy less than or equal to e low or energy greater than e high, uh, we can answer the question of whether um, a witness is accepted or rejected. So that's the idea of how we can use the solution to the local Hamiltonian problem to solve any problem in QMA. Okay? Except there's one thing we haven't explained yet. And that's how we encode the clock. And this part's a little tricky because we want to be sure that it's an encoding such that um, the Hamiltonian will be local. And there are different ways to do this, but I'm going to explain the simplest one. It's kind of a dumb way of encoding the clock, um, but uh, it works. I call it a unary encoding, uh, by which I mean we're actually going to, um, you know, if, if I represented uh, the time in binary, then I would only need log capital T of bits to uh, encode capital T different possible times. But I'm actually going to use um, capital T bits to encode T times. In other words, I'm not going to allow all binary strings, just special ones. Time zero is all zeros. Time one means one in the first place, the rest zero. Time two means one, one in the first two places, the rest zeros. Time three, one, 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 followed by zeros and so on. So I'm only considering strings which start with some sequence of ones and then the rest of the bits are zero and it's the location of the domain wall, so to speak, uh, the transition from one to zero, which encodes the time. If I only want the clock to be, um, to have states of that form, if all other states of the clock are to be invalid, I want to penalize those invalid states. Well, it's enough to uh, penalize the case where one follows a zero. Uh, for these valid stock uh, clock states, it's okay for a zero to follow a zero and for a one to follow a one and for a zero to follow a one, but it's forbidden for a one to follow a zero. Once I've made the switch over from one to zero, I can never go back to one again. And so to enforce that, it's enough to write down a local Hamiltonian, which penalizes invalid uh, clock states. And what it has to do is for each pair of indices, um, where these indices uh, run from one to capital T, indicating the location in this sequence of capital T bits, um, I penalize uh, a pair of adjacent bits in the string being zero, one. Zero, zero is okay, one, one is okay, one, zero is okay, zero, one is penalized. And so then the only states of the clock which have zero energy are going to be these valid states. Now in our uh, H-prop part of the Hamiltonian, we have terms that project onto a particular time and we have terms that advance the time and we have the Hermitian conjugate terms which uh, retard the time. So now we need to be able to uh, write down those terms in a way which is local, which just acts on a constant number of uh, qubits. But once we've enforced the valid uh, clock encoding, the the, uh, it's enough to project onto a particular time to project onto two successive bits having the value one zero, okay? So if I know that um, the indices labeled by uh, one are one zero, then I know the time is T. 
Um, well, actually, I guess if I want to check uh, time zero, um, then I would just have to check that the first bit is zero. But uh, for all later times, uh, this two local operator does the job. And for time zero, um, it's actually just uh, a one local operator. It just looks at the first bit to see whether it's zero or one. If it's zero, that's time zero. And um, so likewise, unless we're talking about uh, time zero or time capital T, if I want to advance the time from T minus one to T, now I can look at three bits in succession. And if I see a one zero zero to advance the time, I replace that by one one zero. And if I want to retard the time, uh, if I see for a particular three bits, the state one one zero, then I know the time is the one corresponding to the domain wall here between one and zero. And I move the domain wall uh, one step to the left uh, to change to the earlier time. This had to act on three bits instead of just two, because if I changed one one to zero one, uh, that might be changing the one ones uh, you know, to, the, to the left of the domain wall. I want to be sure I'm really at the location of the domain wall so that this uh, one is followed by a zero uh, before I'm going to be willing to uh, flip this one and in effect move the domain wall one step to the left. So these are three local operators, okay? And uh, therefore, if I have a set of universal gates where all the gates in the set act on a pair of qubits, and we know there are such universal gate sets, then my H prop will be five local because we have terms that um, add an additional gate in the uh, register for the quantum computer and uh, advance the time um, in the clock register and the Hermitian conjugate of these which apply UT adjoint and retard the time. And these act on five qubits because the clock part of the Hamiltonian acts on three qubits of the clock. <coughs> and then we also have the unitary that changes the state of the quantum computer, which acts on a pair. So now we've got it. The Hamiltonian is HN, HN plus H out plus H prop plus H clock. All the terms are five local and um, If we can estimate the energy of this Hamiltonian to one over poly n accuracy, uh, we can check whether um, you know the witness is accepted or not, and that's enough to uh, solve problems in QMA. And um, that means it's got to be a QMA hard problem to um, find the ground state energy to that accuracy. And as I've already remarked. Uh, since once we prepared the ground state or a state that overlaps sufficiently with it, we can use phase estimation to me measure the energy. So that means preparing ground states has got to be hard in general, QMA hard. Now, we haven't paid any attention to geometric locality here. I haven't worried about how the clock qubits are laid out uh, relative to the qubits of the quantum computer. Um, now, it is possible to uh, strengthen the argument so that we can make everything geometrically local. That requires a different way of encoding the clock. I have to encode it in a more uh, distributed way so that each one of the gates I want to perform in the quantum computer can just look locally around to see what time it is on the clock. And there are, there are ways of doing that, uh, it turns out. And um, in fact, uh, we can reduce the um, k locality, we can reduce k further all the way down to two local. With qubits, um, I'm not explaining the details, uh, but it's a true fact that it's already QMA hard to find the ground state energy for in two dimensions, a two local Hamiltonian 
where we have a lattice of qubits and the Hamiltonian is a sum of terms uh, acting on pairs of neighboring qubits in a two-dimensional lattice. And if we're willing to go beyond qubits and consider higher dimensional systems, um, I'm not sure what the current record is, but uh, uh, systems which have uh, um, a local dimension of 12 is good enough, uh, which we can encode with four qubits, for example. Um, so if we, if we have a chain in one dimension of d-dimensional systems where d is 12 or greater, the problem of finding the ground state energy of such a Hamiltonian is uh, QMA hard in general. So you can think of that if you like as an encoding with qubits where the terms in the Hamiltonian um, can act on in the chain, uh, neighboring qubits, um, I guess act on let's say eight qubits which are adjacent in the chain uh, with four of them encoding one d-dimensional system and four of them encoding another d-dimensional system where um, d is, uh, well, it could be 16, but I guess 12 is enough. And that, that was a surprise, certainly a surprise to me. We already knew in the case of um, the classical case that two local um, spin glasses in two dimensions are NP hard to find the uh, minimum energy. And so it wasn't that big a shock to find that there's a comparable statement for quantum systems on a two dimensional lattice where we have qubits and a two local Hamiltonian, it's QMA hard to minimize the energy. Uh, but in the classical case, one dimensional spin chains are easy. Uh, to find the minimum energy. But in the quantum case, because of the non-commutativity of terms in the Hamiltonian, we can frustrate even a one-dimensional system and it can be very hard to find the ground state energy. And it's, it's turned out uh, that one can go uh, even further in a certain direction. Another result, which uh, is fascinating and, and somewhat surprising is that we can ask about the problem of estimating the energy gap asymptotically as the system size gets larger. You know, whenever we talk about uh, QMA or NP, we're considering a language. So we have problems with variable input size. But let's say that we have a um, Hamiltonian that's translation invariant except maybe for some boundary conditions at the end. So we can imagine a one-dimensional uh, chain of d-dimensional systems where the Hamiltonian is a sum of terms acting on pairs of adjacent d-dimensional systems on the chain, but uh, different terms in the Hamiltonian don't commute with one another because they uh, have in common one of the systems that that they act on. In other words, if you act on one Hamiltonian X on um, uh, d-dimensional systems labeled six and seven, another one X on seven and eight, and those terms don't commute with one another. Uh, you can ask about how the energy gap, the gap between the ground state energy and the first excited state behaves as the size of the system uh, goes to infinity. Translation invariant system, except for the boundary conditions. So uh, the Hamiltonian um, has a fixed form and the only, the only variable now is the system size. And the yes or no question that we're interested in is uh, does that gap asymptotically go to zero or um, does it remain a non-zero constant in the limit of infinite size? So uh, physicists say, is the system gapless or not? We say it's gapless if the energy gap goes to zero, that is gapped. If the gap between um, lowest energy and first excited state is above a non-zero constant, even as the system size goes to infinity. And it turns out this is a undecidable problem. 
okay? Um, it's always possible to encounter a surprise as you go to larger and larger systems. You might think, oh, it's gapless, it's gapless, it's gapless. And then uh, suddenly you find, no, it's not. When the system size, uh, of course, you don't really know it's gapless until you get to infinite size because it's a statement about infinite size. Uh, but uh, the point is that for arbitrarily large system size, this is why it's undecidable, there can be a kind of abrupt changeover from what looks like uh, an energy gap that's uh, going to zero to one that's not or vice versa. And so uh, it's kind of a remarkable thing about what seems to be uh, a somewhat natural uh, many body physics problem. Not only is it computationally hard to solve, it's actually undecidable to solve whether the system is gapless or not. Although admittedly, uh, one has to uh, has to be rather clever in designing the local Hamiltonians that uh, have this undecidable property. And there might, they might not be ones that uh, would occur in naturally occurring systems. But you know, we, we really, we should be broadening our uh, view about what's naturally occurring as quantum engineering advances because systems that uh, you might not find out in the field uh, when you pick up a rock are ones that we'll uh, increasingly be able to uh, realize with our quantum devices. So those have become part of physics as well. And we can say the same about geometric uh, non-locality. Geometric locality is, is natural because usually uh, physics is local. Uh, only systems that are near one another interact substantially. But it's possible to engineer systems which have geometrically non-local interactions and we can study them in the lab and investigate their properties. So uh, that's part of physics as well. So uh, we've, we've come to the end. Uh, there's a lot uh, we haven't covered. This is, is the last course of the term. Uh, you will uh, continue uh, if you're so inclined. Uh, next term with Professor Kataya and what he does in uh, his part of the course is up to him. I expect, though, that he will uh, um, address the issue of quantum error correction and how to protect quantum computers against noise, which is also a very remarkable um, development in the subject. I think, of course, what uh, we focused on in recent lectures is that quantum computers can solve problems we think are too hard to solve classically. And that is a fascinating and amazing thing that there's a difference between classical and uh, quantum worlds as far as what are the hard problems is concerned. But uh, I think uh, another discovery dating back to the 1990s, which is um, of comparable importance is the discovery of quantum error correction that despite the uh, prevalence of of decoherence, despite the noise that quantum systems are subject to, uh, we can, with reasonable resources in principle, make them behave. We consider quantum systems of uh, asymptotically large size. We can control them using the principles of quantum error correction. And in particular, we can make a noisy quantum computer behave like an ideal quantum computer with a reasonable resource cost. To a remarkable extent, by the way, the uh, shining uh, results in the whole field of quantum computing are due to Professor Kataya. Uh, so it, it will be a privilege uh, for those of you who uh, choose to take advantage of it uh, to hear from him, um, his wisdom about the subject. Uh, so much of it uh, we owe to him and his uh, very creative contributions. There's a lot I haven't covered, some of which he will cover, but some of which he will not. Uh, we actually have a course now on quantum cryptography, which has been taught a couple of times by Thomas Fittick, not being offered this term, while Thomas is, uh, is on leave and enjoying himself in Paris, speaking, uh, teaching a special topics course there, actually, which is online. Uh, and. Uh, sure is very interesting. But at any rate, um, quantum cryptography is a fascinating topic. I made a few oblique references to it. 
it's based on the uh, idea that um, we can't observe quantum systems without disturbing them in some detectable way. And that makes it possible to design protocols whose security is founded on principles of quantum physics rather than computational assumptions. Uh, like in the case of RSA, I explained how the security of RSA was upended by the discovery of Shor's algorithm. Um, there's an alternative approach to protecting our privacy based on quantum communication. And um, we have a course on that, which is offered from time to time. Another thing we haven't talked about in this class is the hardware. I made a few occasional references to it, but how do you actually do this stuff? How do you build quantum devices? A fascinating and a rapidly evolving subject for which we have a course, which however, isn't being offered this year on quantum hardware and techniques. Um, of course, sometimes we have special topics courses on uh, quantum topics and one uh, which has been offered in the past and I think will be again in the future. Uh, it was taught by Austin Minich last year was specifically about near-term quantum computers because that of course is also an aspect of the subject which is rapidly evolving. There are quantum computers now admittedly small ones with limited power uh, that one can access through cloud interfaces. That will be increasingly true. And uh, Austin uh, Minich taught a course focused on the things we can do or hope to do with near-term quantum computers and uh, simulating what they do and actually running quantum computations on real platforms. It's a very important and at this stage pivotal question can we do things with these near-term noisy quantum computers before we have enough physical qubits to implement full-blown error correction? Uh, can we run interesting applications on them? That's still an open question and an important one to address in the next couple of years. We actually now have a quantum science and engineering minor, which is just getting underway. Uh, I didn't actually know uh, until uh, this was uh, introduced that it's possible to have a minor in a PhD program, but uh, it is. And uh, by taking a few courses, um, including this one, uh, that is uh, 219, um, you can qualify for uh, this QSE minor. It's something that would go on your PhD diploma. Uh, and at least uh, if you were trying to convince a prospective employer that you've been trained in quantum science and engineering, uh, this would be a way of providing documentation for this. I've been teaching a course on quantum computing for a while, so is Kataya. Um, for the first time in 1997-98, a number of times since then. And the, uh, the topic has evolved and the course has evolved to some degree. The material that uh, we covered in this term was mostly known in uh, already back in the 90s. I, I still consider it to be an essential part of the uh, quantum knowledge that someone interested in uh, pursuing research in this field uh, should know. Um, the, uh, I mean, there's a lot more that could have been said about quantum algorithms, of course. A, a lot has been discovered about them in uh, the last 20 years, but I think what we took the time to cover, understanding uh, phase estimation and period finding and applications to uh, quantum problems are, are still among the most important things to know, Grover's algorithm as well. So I think uh, you've seen a lot of the essentials. As you saw, we spent a lot of time on some of that background material at the beginning. That wasn't completely necessary. I could have talked about quantum algorithms without going into uh, quite so much detail on uh, density operators and uh, quantum channels. Um, but I consider that also to be essential for uh, more advanced investigations or study of the topic. And I also think it's pretty interesting uh, material that usually isn't covered uh, in physics classes on quantum mechanics 
but in the arena of quantum information is, is, quite, uh, is quite essential. So uh, that brings the course to a close. Uh, I appreciate your uh, loyal attendance uh, to these lectures. Uh, even though I can't see you, I know you're out there and it's been a pleasure having the opportunity to share this topic with you. It's certainly a fascinating one. It's a rapidly developing and growing field of science and technology. And I expect that will continue for uh, some years to come. And uh, I hope some of what you learned in this, cast, in this course, uh, you will uh, carry with you in your future endeavors. So um, that's it. And uh, I guess I don't have to say see you next time. Although I'm sure I'll see you around at some stage uh, in the future when uh, human beings come into physical contact with, um, with one another again. And, uh, you know, if you happen to see me crossing the campus uh, when that, uh, when the coronavirus era has, uh, has reached its, uh, its termination, uh, I might not know you because I didn't see you when I was teaching the class, but come up and say hello and say, hey, I took your course and uh, it was okay. Uh, or just say hello. And uh, you may know me, but uh, I might not know you. And of course, that's one of the regrets that in this, um, in this era, um, it wasn't possible for us to have that direct contact. But anyway, uh, please take care of yourselves, be careful, stay healthy. And uh, I uh, well, hope to see you someday. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>